Hey, Goran. Hey, guys. Hey. Can you hear me good? Yep. Uh, let me see. Oh, so this is a new experience, working with teams. Uh, why? Okay, so you guys recording it, or how do you decide on that one? Yeah, we will record the screen along with the audio. Yeah, um, but if, if you have any other software, you can also do it. But we are doing it from R&D, yes. No, I'm trusting you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Dhruv is also doing it, I am also doing it, so <laughs> something will work. Yeah, perfect. I do like that. How does it work when I do screen sharing in Teams? Do you have that small uh, video when I do screen sharing, or does mm. it only show me the screen? Only show you the screen. If you see at yeah. the right side corner near the leave button, you have the sharing option. That's it. Oh, um, oh, but... Uh, yeah. Ah, perfect. And now when you're talking, I can see you down in the bottom right. Can you see me yeah. down there? Okay. Uh, if I share my screen, I see you. But if you share your screen, you see someone yes. else. If he is talking, then he he will be visible there. Ah, okay. Perfect. And since I'm not talking, I am seeing every one of you. Each one of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dirk. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so meanwhile, when people are joining, I will put on some music. So let's have some music. I have a question for Tigran. Yeah. Is it the real background or it's a virtual one? Because it's really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sitting up in uh, Mr. Stark's office here with Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually had a, a friend. I had the bat cave earlier. And someone actually, first look, he thought that that was my uh, my home office. And I was like, well, not really that cool. But, Very nice. <laughs> uh, but go. I think I should... Where do I... <sighs> Come on, Ashtoj, I'm waiting for that music, man. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear the music? No. No? no. Give, me, give me. I need to share my screen. No? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I will be playing it again.
let's give two more minutes and then we'll start started first of all thanks everyone for joining uh, today we are having a session from service no mavericks on the topic called as data stream actions and pagination from a well-known personality um, you can see the name goran the beach doctor uh, he does not need an introduction but for a formal introduction we will have his uh, introduction in the upcoming slides uh, Coming back to the slides, I'm your host, Ashutosh. I'm working with NN Group in Netherlands um, as a technical lead architect, and um, I'm a community MVP. Um, so about Goran, he is well known by, uh, let's say, two letters, and they, those are witch doctor, and we don't have to explain why he's so famous. Uh, he has a vast experience of more than 10 years in service now industry now. He is himself a trainer, a motivator, a developer, an architect, and a blogger, and a YouTuber. So he has been awarded five times with the ServiceNow MVP. He has written a book for people like us who wants to get started with ServiceNow. Um, we recommend to get in touch with him or get a book, uh, buy, a, buy a book so that you can get started with ServiceNow. Also, he has his own channel on ServiceNow, which you guys can follow, which also has many videos, which will help you to understand uh, basics of ServiceNow from basic till advanced, I would say. So um, I will hand over the stage to Goran, and then we will get started. So over to you, Goran. I will stop thank sharing you. my screen. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and try to show you some guys what so it's not all, all about and what magic we can do about it. Uh, it's always better when someone else introduces yourself because I hate talking about myself. So thank you so much for that one. Uh, <clears throat> I hate PowerPoint as well. As you, if you have seen my videos, I don't have much of them in there. So I'm, I'm going to head straight into showing and telling. Uh, feel free to ask questions when I do it. It's always more fun to have someone else to talk to and not just me talking around for like 40 minutes or so. If we get too many questions, I'll just, just pause and take them at the end. Um, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to go through what the data stream action is and what you can do. And then I'm thinking of actually taking YouTube as an example and call that API and show you how you can actually do it in a real life. Uh, I won't go into licensing. Uh, 
I work at ServiceNow internally now, so I have the privilege not having to think about that so much. But if I'm not wrong, or we have changed anything, you need to have the enterprise interhub license to get this. Um, is there something else to say before I start? No, I don't think so. Let's uh, let me start the screen sharing. There is that, and where? Here we go. Yeah, uh, we can see your screen. Perfect. So basically, uh, the data stream action that is, of course, uh, flow designer stuff. And I really hope that you have been working with Flow Designer. It came in Kingston, I think. So it's been around for a while now, and I really recommend start using it if you haven't done that. So basically, I'll just hit, ah, look, I already had it open as well. Let me just, yeah, perfect zoom as well, and I'll remove that one. So when you have it installed, when you click on new, you will have the data stream down here, which is used to actually create the data stream. So clicking that, you can see this is just like any normal custom action that you're building. I'll just do this as, as a test. And I'll just hit submit. And if you have built custom actions before, you have seen that on the left, you can have different steps. In the, this data stream action, you can actually not add your own. They are predefined, but some is selectable, so you can decide if you want to use it or not, and so on. So I'm going to go through this first, and then we'll take a look at how we actually build it with YouTube as an example. The top one is the inputs. It's basically what you use if you want to use data inside action that's come from the outside, from the flow perhaps, or something like that. Then you create the inputs here, just like a label, the variable, and what type it is. Next step is pre-processing, and that is basically what you want to do before you start doing the rest calls or soap calls, for example. Uh, I have one case, for example, where we were getting in a record where it had, it had regions, like EMEA and, and so on, but the API required to have like one, two, or three to recognize which region it was. So in this pre-processing script, I actually did the code to change that. And here you can see, if I want to use the pre-processing, I'll just check this one, and then you can see that step pops up here. Then I can click on that and run it just like a script step in any other uh, custom action you're using. Good to know here is that if I start typing something like this, and then somehow goes up here again and uncheck it, it's gone. So if I click this again, you can see the code I just wrote went away. So be careful to not accidentally do that. Of course, if you haven't saved, you can always just close the action and reopen it again. But that's one thing you have to look out for when you're doing this. Next step is the request. And as you can see, some of these are mandatory. It's like, how do you want to get the data? And this is, of course, for the data stream to know, should it present a rest step or a soap step? In this case, just hit rest, for example. You can see the rest step popping up. And then you can decide here, uh, yeah, uh, meetup. Sorry, did we have a, a question? Or just accidentally unmute? No, I think accidentally. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is also the place where you enable pagination if you want to have that uh, or not. Uh, I myself say, I all, even if I know I will be using pagination, I always keep it out first to make sure that the rest step and I get back the data I want before I turn on pagination as the second step to see that it's actually working. Now, let me just check my notes as well so I don't miss something when we go through. Nope. And then we have the run as a script. And if you want to have that, you can see the script step 
popped up as well. This means that if you run pagination, and if I check that one, it's up here. So for each time I do pagination, I maybe want to do some scripting before I do the rest call. I myself have never used this myself, but there are probably reasons to use this as well. I just haven't stumbled over it yet. So let me just uncheck those two. The rest step is just a basically, if you have built custom actions earlier with the rest step, this is just like that one, uh, using the connecting alias, hopefully, uh, to have it more dynamic. And then you build the step itself down here so you can actually um, send what data the API needs. Mm. Then, of course, we need to handle the data we get back. And that is what you do down here at parsing. So first, you need to decide. Uh, <clears throat> this is like just one choice, but you need the choices. We get back either a JSON or XML. And then we'll use the script parser to parse them into an object. And right now, there's only one selection here, but it's not default that you still need to go in and, and select them. So this is the splitter step. And here, here I need to decide the data I get back. Is it a JSON or XML? And let's say JSON, for example. And then you need to decide, or not decide, you need to write in where in the response body is the data that I want to go through. So when you look later on, when we see the example from YouTube, it's under an element called uh, items. So make, perhaps doesn't make sense now, but let me just type it to show you. So we got the root and then we just type items. This is where in the response body, the items that we want to parse is coming. And then the last part, I guess, is what data do I want? and where do I want to put it? There are some, quite some good examples here, both for JSON and XML. I'll just do like this so it makes it a little bit easier to read. And you will see the example with the YouTube later on as well. But what you basically say, inputs.source item, that is each item we're getting back. We're looping through them one by one and we're putting that into the item. And then we say first name should go into FF name, target name, LL, and so on. And you can see we can dot walk as well, just like any normal stuff. And when we have decided that this is all the things we want, we only want to have these three things, then we go to the output, and this is the place where we build a complex object that we are going to use. So we're basically hitting create. We're calling it, for example, video, like we're going to do, and it needs to be an object. If it doesn't, it won't work. And here, the most important part is that when we create the, <coughs> the parameters inside object, we need to have the same variable name as you put here. So if you want to have first name, which the example is this, we do first name and then the variable name there. Then it will work and it will make much more sense when we go over and look at a real example. Uh, any questions before we actually dive into YouTube example and see how it can look? I can take a clunk of water. I don't see any questions still yep. in the chat yet, but if yep. you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah, that's what we are here for. So let's get rid of this one and let's open up. <laughs> I learned the hard way to have a, and I don't like having a Mac with this double click to zoom in come on okay i'll do it like this i'm sorry about that 
Come on, here we go. Actions. And we have, I'm going to show you the one without pagination first, just to give you an example. So, what we're going to do is we want to talk to the YouTube API and talk to the one where you actually send a, a, a playlist ID and get back all the videos. And me, I used Postman a lot, just try out the API to get it to work there first before I move it into ServiceNow. So just to show you. So this is basically the, the URL. You have, uh, you have my API, but don't worry, it will be changed after this meeting. It's just my own as well. So uh, the part parameter is basically just a YouTube way to say what details or what information do you want. Uh, we have the playlist ID, how many results we will get back, and something called page token, which is for the pagination. So if I just hit 10, I'll send back. And here, uh, sorry, I can't zoom. I hope it's, it's good enough. But this is the result back. Here is items. Remember in the splitter part, that is the thing we want because that's an array with each video as an object in it. So that is the one we wanted. So that's the reason why we said dollar dot items to get there. Uh, and then you can see in each item we have like ID snippets and things like that. That is the stuff that we want to get. So this is what we want to build in the data stream action. So if I just switch over back, and in this case, I would like to have <coughs> the playlist ID as an input so I can reuse this action. And it's just a, a normal spring. I don't have any pre-processing. And for this case, I don't do any pagination in the first step. So this is how the rest step looks like. Uh, I'm using the connection alias where I have defined the credentials and the URL. You can see I have the base URL. Uh, I won't go into this video about how you're doing that, but it's a really good way of making it work in your dev, test, prod environment and so on. You can see we have the resource path. And here you can see we have the part, the playlist ID, I'm actually stealing from the input string. The key is the credentials. And in this case, I have max results 50. And that's it. Then we're done with the rest step. <clears throat> For the splitter, you can see I said JSON, and it was the item path. And for the parsing step, I have done one extra step. <clears throat> And as you can see, that's this part. Already, when I'm going through the response, I can decide if it's something I don't want to have or it's something I want to have. And in this case, I'm looking at item.status.privacy status. If that's not public, I don't care about that video. I don't even need to have it in my area of results. So I use the outputs.state equals skip to just skip that one. And if you go to Postman, you can see we had item.status, and let me try and find it from here we go, and then we have private status is public. So this is the one I'm looking for. Then I've decided that short description, I called an output object. I can show you that first though. I build one called video, and in video, I have short description, image link, correlation ID, position, and description. So these are the ones I want. And as you can see, when I parse it here, even if I need to dot walk to get to title, I don't need to build the same structure here to actually get it. So I'm kind of taking a shortcut. But this is pretty much what we need. So let's give it a shot and hit the test functionality. And let's see if I got that one, I think. Hit run. And we wait and hope for the best. It says completed, so it looks good. 
let's click on the action stream here we can see and when we do testing <clears throat> even with pagination later on you will see that the result we get back is only 20 items that's how they do it even if we in the rest we're clicking on uh, Microsoft 50 we only in the testing gets back uh, 20 of them you can the quickest way to see if you get the correct data is to click here and here you can see this is the stuff that we wanted so that that looks good you can of course drill down a little bit to look at each step you can see the rest step you can see what values did we have and, and so on if we scroll down the only thing you can you can see the loop that is done if you find in, in the auto items so this one looks good so let's put on pagination on this one so let's just open the second one <clears throat> and this basically you looks like that one I have only done one minor change for a surprise uh, at the end but what you can see in this one I have actually made an object called info and put in short description and description here and to visualize it you can see that I have the video object and inside there I have a nestled complex object which two more just to give you uh, <coughs> a hint of what, what's coming up later on but otherwise it looks the same now for pagination if we look at the YouTube what they do is if there are more data to look at they will give you a next page token so as long as there is an element called this one we know there's more more data to get so if I uh, let's take 50 instead you can see and then if I take that token <clears throat> and use a parameter called page token I'll paste that one in now I get the last one and now we can see I don't have next page token anymore because there isn't a next page there is a previous page so I can actually go back if I want but this is how the pagination works with this API uh, just for fun you can look at the end you, can, you will always get in this case the page information uh, <clears throat> how many there are and results per page so this is what we're going to use so we go I have checked the pagination and when I go back here you can see this variable is the one that we're using to tell the data stream should I get more or not default value is always false you can't actually change that one and then you can define what other variables do I need in our case we need a variable called next page token it's empty from the start you can define if you're using for example um, offset and limit uh, pay nation this is the place where you can set zero perhaps as offset and so on we need to decide where do we get this information we can either just say this information is saved through the script or we actually fetch it from the response body and if you choose that one we decide how do you want to extract the value it's JSON and where does that value exist and as you can see it's the root and then you have it right there and if we look at postman and I scroll up you can see okay <clears throat> of course we have the page token but you can see we got the root and then we have the next page token so that's the one we want to fetch then we need to define okay when should we actually stop so what we're doing here is we're looking at that variable and as long as that variable is undefined we say get net action equals true which means that it will run the pagination after each page if it's not true it sets to false and the pagination stops and the data stream completes it's very important that if you 
messed stuff up here, you can get uh, uh, everlasting loop. And we've all been there, and I'll probably not the last time either. So just be sure that you have uh, a stopped condition in here that you can actually use. Uh, let me see here. I'm just going to go through. Uh, good to know as well that all the, the variables, they are strings. So if you are going to, besides the get net page, of course, there are always something that doesn't go by the rule. But if we would have another one, like the offset, uh, and we want to do some magic, like... Uh, and I want the offset to do, let me show you, normally you have offset is zero, and then you have limit. So this one says we're basically always having 50, and then next catch, the offset, is, offset should be 50, then 100, and so on. If we want to do math in here we need to actually do like this uh, let's do war offset equals and then put the variable in here and transform it to integer do the math and when we're done we of course need to revert it like with two string to get it back and i actually forgot the to show you a really good place to do this is, let me show you, I need to create a new data stream. I'll just make a test. And we'll go to pagination. Meanwhile, we have one question from Dirk. Tell you yeah. creating this. He's asking if you have, if you created an infinite loop with the pagination, is there a way to identify it and stop it? Runtime? Uh, well, basically, what I do, I go back to active trans transactions here. Transactions. Uh, I don't remember. Depending how you run the flow or test it, I, I have to go in here. And uh, here we go. And I actually hit uh, kill to make it go away. And sometimes if it's a flow, sometimes you can go in and um, cancel, right click on the flow context and cancel it. I have noticed that it doesn't work always. Uh, it might be that I'm too, what you call it in, in English. I can't, I don't wait so long. So if I just waited a little bit longer, it would actually cancel, but I'm too, I just want to, to kill it. <laughs> so I, I'll do this or I say do it by script as well. Uh, two seconds. Isaac, ping dong. I'm sitting here with my son as well playing games. So, um, so back to pagination. With the first time, when you haven't done anything and you didn't see this because since I already built it, uh, there are pre made templates for how pagination could look like. And right now, there's only one, and hopefully, we will uh, add more. But if you have an API that uses limit offset, you could actually just go in here, hit apply template, and here you can see it has pre-built the script for you a little bit. And here you can see, just like I said, you need to do the parsing to get it and do whatever you want. You can see to be able to build a new offset. And then when you set the offset, you need to do the two string. Uh, so that was what I'm talking about, that it needs to be a string when you do it. Um, we're talking about page size as well. Uh, data stream is built to handle big loads. So the more data you can get back uh, at each uh, load, do that. That's, that's the way I'm going. Uh, I have actually managed to break something, but that load turned out to be really big. I think the recommended size, I try not to get something back that is bigger than one, one gigabyte, but I think that's not so often that happens. So, but that's kind of the advice on what we're going to look at. Um, let's go back to the YouTube. And we'll ditch those two. 
because that was my poorly made demo about the offset. There we go. So this is basically the pagination step. As long as we have a next token, we'll get the next page. Let's take a look at the rest step. What's new in the rest step? And as you can see, we have the same stuff, but at the end, I have the page token. And here, I can actually say that I want to use the value that is in the pagination variable, this one, which you can see out here. So I basically just say the next page, put the token in here. And then everything else looks the same. So let's let's do a test run and see. I'll paste in that one again. And see how that one looks like. Uh, here we go. Now we can see we have three uh, pages. You can see still we got 20 as an output. And down here you could actually see uh, <clears throat> the script, the pagination script, the values for the first one. And if I go to the next, you can see that now I have a next page token and the next page token, then we're done with the, with the loop. And the rest is just the same uh, as the other one, but here you can see that it's working. If you would like to get a better view, you need to put this one in a flow. So let's, let's go and see how it looks when you do it in a flow. Uh, I'll move that one. Yeah, meanwhile, we have another question. Yeah. And uh, it is from Nitin. He says, how do we differentiate between batching and pagination? I, I honestly don't really know what you, what's the, the difference between those two. In my world, is, is that the same? Or are you talking about batching as... Um, let's see if I, I had an example, for example, LinkedIn learning, you can get the user progress from an API, but when you do the, the call for the user progress, you can only, uh, only set the time frame for maximum of 14 days. So you set a start date and how many days, and then you get the data back, and probably the data you get back is pagination, uh, because you get more than 50 results back. Uh, if you want to have like a month of user data back, you need to do basically two calls because the first 14 days and then the next 14 days. Is that what you mean by batching? Uh, just to add batching, I mean, it sounds like the same thing. Basically, what I have understood is uh, Pagination works in a form of batching itself. It uh, fetches uh, page one record uh, of records of page number one. It processes yeah. those and then bring on the next page. So it's kind of the same thing what I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In my world, it's it's the same, same thing as well. Uh, I think it relates. <laughs> Yeah, but Nitin, if you have any follow-up question, you can always post it or you can ask yep. it to run. And Absolutely. then the next question is, is there any shortcut to include all pages? To in, well, that's to include all pages. Maybe I mean, Dhruv, you can, uh, because Drew asked this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> if I remember, I have uh, in other tools that uh, I have used, like Salesforce and all, so if you want to do pagination, we can set the default page to zero or one, but there is something like uh, we used to set it to minus one to fetch all the pages. So just want to sh uh, be sure that if there is something like this in service now as well. I haven't seen it. The only, the only place I've seen the minus one on pages is on the logging side. I mean, you still need to, to build the pagination depending on how the API is. 
No, I don't think so. I'll, I'll, I'm looking for a pen, but I realize that I don't own a pen, I guess. Uh, let me just write it down, and I'll, I'll talk to the people and see. Uh, but you, you're actually meaning that somehow I should just set pages to minus one and get all the pages? Yeah, I mean, if not uh, all the pages at once, but uh, maybe the details of those pages. I mean, when I'm testing the action, so yeah. I should be able to get the details of all the pages. I mean, it will impact the performance, but from testing point of view, it would be important. Yeah, I mean, uh, the only way, I mean, you still need to build this pagination because otherwise the data stream doesn't know how to get it. Uh, and the closest thing when we're talking about see all pages, what I could think of if when I, and this is a, a, a system property you can set on service now, because when, when you test, you basically get back, or even in the logging, you get the last five pages. But in that property, you can define how many pages the logging should show. And if you, in that uh, property set minus one, it will show all uh, the pages for you. Okay, so that is some property. Okay, I'll just have a yeah. look on. Yeah, I think actually, to be honest, that property, if you go to docs and go to the data stream property, I, it's it's, a, it's an official property, so you can find it there. Uh, I can look it up for you as well, uh, if you just give me a second, uh, just to show you guys. We got the time, so I'll data stream. Uh, I'll just need to do this because I realized I have the Quebec version here as well. Um, uh, let's see. Data stream. Oh, come on. Create data stream, data stream. Uh, let me let me come back with that in the end, so we don't stall the whole presentation for me trying to find it on on docs. But yeah, it's there. Um, but I hate not being able to do the answer directly. Mm. But let's let's go back to the flow. We we'll do the test flow for pagination. Yeah, I will also make a note of these questions and maybe yeah. forward it to you. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'll just do something like that. So. We'll and done and now when I add the action here you will see that what happens is it's build up for each loop for you um, I just put in the playlist ID and then in here I decide what do I want to do which is item I get back and you can already see out here that I got the video object and the info object and all that data. Uh, so just to show you that it works, I'll just do a log comment. Here is the video and then I'll just say that I would like to see the... And let's dot work for fun, the short description of each one. So I'll hit save. And I'll do test, run. Here we go. And now you can see we found 62 videos. And here we can see if I loop through them. You can see each one being in there. I can click on this one to build it up. And here you can see it's showing the last five of eight total. Uh, I can go into the page details and you can start, uh, if I look at this one for example, and you can see we have the next page token. You can go in and see that it's actually here in the, in the query that we sent. And you can drill down to see. The only thing you can't really see is 
the output of that specific object. Uh, one thing that makes data stream action very good in performance is, uh, and it might be taking into consideration how what the requirements are, but we don't save the data you get back, we process it uh, automatically. So if you need to keep the data like in an import set uh, for storage or something like that, then we, need, we can still use this one, but I'm going to show you soon how you do it with import sets instead. But in here, you could basically do whatever you want. I mean, you can, with this data, you can create paths, you can create records, whatever you want. The only thing you can do is do actions that puts um, the flow to actually go to sleep. For example, I can put in a ask for approval ask in here, because then the flow stops and goes to sleep and waits for that approval to actually happen. So that's one thing or one of the limitations of this um, data stream flow. Um, where is my mouse? There we go. So that was the pagination. Any questions about that so far? Any more questions? Uh, I'm going through and take a look while we wait. No, no. I don't see anything in chat. No. Yeah. Perfect. I hope that's good. Uh, Good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I want to mention as well is we are um, building this. Yeah. We have a new uh, one question popped up, yeah. uh, and that is asked by Suba. He says, "Also, can we get to know the total page count just after the first call, or how it is?" So that that kind of depends on what the API returns to you. And if you look at uh, the YouTube one. We actually have that one at the end, uh, the page info total result. So I can fetch that in here and use if I want. Yes, you can do that. Yeah. Um, good to know as well. I have actually stumbled over um, one API that actually uses the offset and the limit one but it didn't give us the total count, which means that I had no clue when to stop because I don't know how many records I would get. And it actually worked in the data stream because when it stopped, it actually returned just an empty array. And if you get that, the data stream action will stop, uh, stop as in being complete. So it, it still works. Uh, if you don't do that, but it's good to know that if the API returns an empty array, so we have nothing to, to split and parse, then the data stream action counts that as complete. Yeah, and any best practices around data uh, stream actions, which we should follow as developers? Yeah, I don't, in, in my case, it's, it's pretty much the same best practice as we go when you look at uh, the rest steps. I would say try to bring in as much data per page that we do. Um, use it. I myself, I use it whenever there is pagination. I use the data stream because I got that functionality out of the box. Why not use it? Uh, there isn't so much. I mean, there's not so much code uh, for it. It's. Um, I wouldn't say there isn't so much. There are not so much, many places to do best practices off. Um, there is, for example, uh, a simple way to, if you don't want to build all this, if the output you have built have the same structure as the item you get back, you could actually just do, if I will just show you, you could basically just do this outputs dot target object equal item. Then you're done. Yep. Uh, which is a quite a, a simple way when you have to do it. And even if the object you get back have all, if I go to the top just to show you, I mean, you get a lot of data back here. 
but you don't need to build all this into your complex object and do the matching and the same structure because what happens is if you write like this if the field doesn't match it just does skip them so you don't really need to care about that so this is a, a simple easy way uh, to do it as well if you want to do it yeah um there are two more questions but uh, should we take yep. it later or should we do it now uh, let me finish up i think i got about 10 minutes and then we can yep. take all the questions uh, yep. by once so let me see here I did that one. I'm just going to see if there's something more before I go over to data sources. Uh, it's also possible to use the data stream action through a mid server. Uh, I have never done it myself. Uh, and there is one thing we're talking about best practice, and that's not data stream related. It's more flow design related. And that is that on production, it's best practice to turn off um, uh, logging uh, due to performance. Yeah. I had a, a stream where I actually fetch a lot of data. And after about seven, eight hours, that actually aired out because I took up almost the whole memory of the instance due to logging of uh, the flow itself. When I turned off the logging, it turn down the performance like four hours and it's finished. So that's one, I guess, best practice. And even if you have turned off logging, and when you do the test uh, functionality, it will run as a developer trace, meaning uh, the most detailed one. So I guess that's one of the best practices I can uh, come up with. Um, another thing as well, if you don't know it, you could actually use both the data stream actions, actions, flows, subflows in your code as well. You could basically just go out here, uh, and this one isn't published, so let's take this one instead. You have code snippet, and here you have actually code to run this data stream on server side or client side. Uh, if you use it on a client side, just the data stream doesn't uh, work, uh, but normal actions, you need to set up ACLs to who's allowed to run it. But you could paste it and it actually has, depending on what kind of action it is, it might have both a synchronous one and an asynchronous ones. So it's really nice to, to be able to use this in code as well. Now, to go back what I was talking about that when you use this in a flow, it doesn't save data and you might need to do that. What you actually can do, and this is new in Paris, you can go to data sources, hit new, and there is actually two kind of related to data stream. And we have the rest, which came earlier than Paris. I don't remember really if it was Orlando or New York. Uh, if I use this one, I'm just going to do it, go around test uh, rest. You can see we have a rest action here. This one can only use the things that you created through this button. Because as you may notice, these are called data source requests. Test one, and you can see I only have a REST step and a pre processing script. There's nothing more for it. I can use this one to put get the data into our import set table, but it's kind of limited. And if you look here, there are pagination built in, but only if the API uses the, the limit and offset. The new cool one in Paris is the data stream. If I choose this one, I could use whatever data stream action I built, someone else built in another spoke, and take that data and put it into my import set table. So let's do that. So let's do go around YouTube. And let's select the one I did. 
And when I hit save, you will see, if you remember, I had an input on that action and it's here. So let's see, here we go. And now I'll just hit load all records. We'll wait, and here we can see, you remember the number? If I go to the import set, uh, you can see that we have, you might not have seen this before, but you can actually see each request. And you can see and actually go to the flow itself or the action itself, the context of the action to see what really happened. And if we look at the row, you can see that here is all the data. If it was a nestled complex object, like you remember had the info, and let me show you, get rid of that one. Uh, we had info as a nestled object like in here. You actually get the whole object here with the information, but it's also being flattened. So you can see info description and info short description is in these fields. So now you can actually use the data stream action to, for example, um, use scheduled imports like this is the data source. And now we go to scheduled, come on, scheduled uh, imports. And now I can use that data source I just created, go and test, for example. And it will run daily and do the import and so on. So this is a new great feature that uh, came in Paris that we really like people to start using uh, as well. Uh, I think we are actually... I'm pretty much done now, to be honest. Uh, yeah, so did, no, go ahead. Do we have any questions that we saved? Yeah, there were two questions. Uh, first yeah. was, um, right now, data stream support REST and SOAP. Uh, in near future, will it be a JDBC uh, support uh, available? <laughs> uh, let's just say, um, uh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, probably. It's okay. not in, in anything's not done, so I haven't looked at the Quebec that deep, so I can't say yes or no. But I know the uh, the request is in there that people want it, so I bet if our people are looking into to that. Yeah. And the next one is, um, can you give some examples where pagination is getting used? So when was this example in any other out of the box folks? Do we have that? Well, that's a good question. I I don't know to be honest. I'm 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 running most likely in the in the custom area when I when I, where I work. Uh, so I don't use so many out of the box spokes. I I know that we have or are building spokes that are using the data streams. Uh, I don't know if those posts are public yet, so I can't mention them, but I know I'm not the only one that are using it. Um, so they are coming. Um, but yeah, uh, not the best answer to my question, I guess, but I wonder, hold on. Do you have any more questions or we have time to take a look? Uh, you, we have questions coming up, but uh, uh, you can have a look at it. Yeah, I'm just going to see. Uh, I was hoping I had the YouTube um, spoke. Because we have a YouTube spoke built for you guys. Uh, I haven't actually looked at that. You can see we have so many stuff. So if you look at the... So what query metrics... 
Yes, I'm just trying to figure out. Now you're on in the way. I can't see how many we have. <laughs> I need to click on that one. Uh, so, look up, look up videos. Let's take a look at that action. Yeah, here you can see the look up videos in our YouTube spoke. That is, for example, a data stream. I wonder if they're doing it like I did. <laughs> mm, yeah, almost a little bit. Yeah. But yes, you can look at, of course, what we built and see if how, how they're doing it. And how, here you can see, for example, we have the duration, which is kind of weird in the YouTube space. So we do all this code um, to then put it in the output. So you can actually not only just map different fields to each other, you can actually do code here and then put it in the output object as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a next question from Arpit. He says, is there a way to dynamically set inputs for data streams from the data sources or from scheduled inputs? Uh, one, is there, or I can look at the chat myself. Huh. Yeah. Is there a way to dynamically set inputs for the data streams from data sources or from scheduled inputs? Uh, well, I uh, hmm, hmm, dynamically. Can we, do you have some kind of example of a use case? For example, now you, you set your uh, um, channel. You, you entered one code, right? When you created the yeah. data yeah. source. So can that be set dynamically? Uh, here I think the code that Goran showed for running the flow or the action, we can use yeah. that. I mean, where we can set up the input variable and can set it to be dynamic yeah i mean normally if i for example i built a flow where i'm actually getting all the different uh, uh, playlists from from my user and then pulling all that stuff uh, in, in that case i have an action first that gives me all the playlists in a in an array and then i just do a for each loop and then go through calling the, the data stream action for each playlist uh, if you're going to do that as a data stream in a schedule import, hmm. I mean, Maybe you could always, yeah. yeah. Maybe then do we, can we do it like, like a scheduled script import? Then we can call the scripted uh, code which you showed. Yeah, of course you can do that as well, so. I think I can't come up with the exact solution now, but it doesn't yeah. feel like it should be something that is impossible or very hard to, to achieve. Great. Um, then the next question is uh, data streams for import sets versus ETL uh, feature which we oh. have in integration up. Can we do a comparison or are there are these two different use cases? I think, I must say that ETL, that is the one, are we talking about the, the robust transform engine? Yeah, ETL, yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you can use that as well. I mean, since we are creating a data source. Uh, oh, come on. Oh, I can spell. Um, I mean, this one, just because I select a data stream here, doesn't mean that it has to go into the old import tables structure. You could still use the robot transfer engine and that functionality instead as well. Yeah, but uh, I think ETL was mostly introduced for CMDP classes. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, you uh, ah, you're talking about that. Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's specific for the CMDB import, where which looks for duplicates and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I think that's deep. If I were going to go into the CMDB, I think I'll probably use that yep. first. Uh, I haven't used that at all myself, 
So don't take my word for it and say that, hey, Goran said we're going to use that <laughs> one. <laughs> but it seems like since we have built something that is specific for the SIMDB, that probably works better in that case. Yeah. So uh, any other question, guys? You have the time to interact with him, but I, I do have a few questions, uh, yeah. maybe basic ones like, um, can you give a motivation for our audience that how they can start using Integration Hub more and more? Well, in my case, I mean, the uses of Integration Hub, I mean, it's there for you. If you're working at an instance which does integrations, you have to pay for Integration Hub. Even if you don't use it, you're doing the scripted way, you have the integration free for you. So, and in my case, I'm not a, what should we call it, a true developer in my eyes, my own eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm not gone to school for five years and, and learned all that stuff. And I really like the flow designer. I like the way that by doing it the graphical way and not so much code, you limit you limit the amount of human errors. <laughs> we all know when you try to write code fast, it, they're always slip ups, I guess. And the way you can do it in Flow Designer, I can probably challenge you guys that name one integration and I can build it faster in integration help and Flow Designer than you can script it. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, that is the, the main part. And easier, easier to administrate all that pros you get with Flow Designer. Um, so, yeah. Then, of course, there are exceptions where you need to go to the scripted way. But I have never needed to do that yet, at least. Uh, and how you see this with citizenship development, which is we are promoting more and more citizenship development. So do you see that data streams integration up together will help the business process owners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with the data stream, we get the pagination. You didn't have that before. Trying to do pagination in a flow, like having the pagination in a for each loop or something like that, it was much, much harder. And I, I can understand if people went the easier way to actually do it in code. I mean, you could a lot easier just do the, the rest step action in Flow Designer and then do code to call that uh, that action. But I mean, now with Integration Hub and it goes so much easier. And like I said, you, you can just see just a few clicks and you got the whole YouTube integration in working. I mean, the time that takes up the most of my time is actually reading the external APIs and trying to understand how they want to have the data. When I know that, it takes just an hour or two to build it in in service now. And like you said, I don't need to know so much about coding to actually do it in, in service now. Yeah. So that is a facilitator for citizenship development, basically. Yeah. And you, you can um, see the amount of spokes that we are also giving you guys to actually pre-build that you can actually just reuse or just copy and tweak a little bit and then it will work for you as well. So, I mean, we're, we're heading down this way. Yeah. Uh, Irsten is asking, just wondering the 1 million free transactions that has been a major concern for us. I'm hearing this never gets exceeded for many custom, uh, customers. But just wondering the experience. Do, have you seen in your life like uh, uh, the one million transactions are exceeded? Uh, she, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but I heard customers that really huge customers that are exceeding that. But like I said, I, I don't know about the license, but I think that when you're that big of a company, you probably have a, a, a big uh, license that they're already paying for as well. So um, maybe I mean, people people are getting more acquainted to integration up now. So in near future, that will be more often. Yeah, I, I I think so as well. I mean, we have the whole world are changing to to do the more and more integrations to have one place to go on and so on. So of course this number of transactions will go up uh, as well. Yeah. 
uh, I have uh, one more question from my end that how you evaluate when you want to you uh, like how you make a decision that you want to go for a data stream action. In my case is compared to what? Um, what is the other option? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in, in my case, I have two options. Either I use the custom action. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but basically you just go to new action, just a name. And then in here I say, hey, I want to do a, a, a rest step. And then you can see the same rest step as the data stream action. And then I need to perhaps add a, a JSON parser to handle the, the object back. And you can see, and then I need to build the output just like in the data stream. This is what I do if I don't have pagination. Uh, and sometimes I'm almost lazy. So I do, even if I don't have pagination right now, I build it in a data stream because it's easier. But if there is pagination in the stuff I want to build, I go for the data stream 10 out of 10 times. Great. Um, any other question, guys? You have a time now, you can ask uh, Goran directly. Uh, Dhruv, do you have anything, Kopal? Uh, so, Guran, I have one question since uh, yeah. I have recently started. Uh, this is out of context from data stream. So, it's like uh, I have recently started creating content uh, for service now on YouTube channel, and yeah. you have been doing it for quite long. So, any tips that I can focus on and any tips? Well, in my case, like I said, I've been a couple of years now, and if you're looking about tips about how, how to grow your subscribers, or is it more in general how to make YouTube content, or? Uh, I mean, better YouTube content. I mean, uh, uh, as we see earlier, last till last year, I can... Uh, feel that only there are two, three people who are creating content. One mm -hmm. is you and from certain service now contents. Mm -hmm. But today there are lots of channels, lots of people are creating content and contributing to the community. I just want to find out the, understand the way to stand out. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's hard to stand out. I think it's the most important thing is that First of all, you need to understand that it takes up time. I mean, it takes up a lot more time to make a video than trying to write a post or an article or something like that on the, on the community. It takes time. Uh, it's, you need to be consistent. What, with that, I mean, you need to, when you put up videos, continue to put up videos. Uh, I've seen a lot of channels coming up and going away because it, it probably, I guess, it takes up more time than they think, or they thought that they get a good subscription base really fast. But it takes time to actually get noticed, to be honest. Uh, and if you just keep doing good stuff, and then I guess luck is a big chunk of it. You need to get noticed, just like you say, someone sharing and someone is following you. But in my case, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, do stuff that if you really want to get noticed, I guess, go to the community. Uh, try to find out what are the most common issues people have. Uh, and then do videos about that. Um, mm -hmm. But most of all, do videos about things that you like, the things that you uh, like to learn about. Because that will be... You can notice that in the video when you hear the people talk about it uh, and so on. And the more fun stuff you learn, the more fun it is to do videos as well. Um, but I, I think it's keep up the work and don't give up if you have done like 10, 15 videos and you don't have so many subscribers and so on. And try to, like I have, for example, 
Uh, whenever you have a signature, if you keep answering questions on the community, have a signature with perhaps a link to your YouTube channel in the bottom, because it will be there forever. So if in one year someone goes into that thread and finds your comment, they will see the link as well, and they might click on that, and then they find your, your comment in, in that place. And then, of course, I'm just talking now, but then, of course, the more social media active you are and spreading all the, your, uh, your content, the more visible you will get. And it's hard. Uh, I must say it's probably a lot harder for you guys that starts now than when I started for a, a few years ago when there wasn't so many. I mean, the competition is much harder now uh, to get noticed that, than for like three, four or five years ago when the, the community were much, much smaller. So you need to be creative of how to find uh, your audience. Yeah. Pretty much like, like I did with my, time, with my Witch Doctor title. I, I just felt like, hey, I, there's tens of thousands of developers or consultants and all that, and I just need to figure something out that sticks, sticks in people's heads and they remember it. That's the, the good part. Yeah. Um, so, uh, any other question, guys? If not, then I will move on with uh, my slide. I need to show uh, one <laughs> slide, which is important. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Goran, for your time and uh, what thank you guys and explained was of great help to us. Uh, so. Uh, I want to say something about our upcoming event, and that is we have an upcoming event on uh, FSO, which will be hosted by Dhruv, uh, facilitated by Gopal, and the labs will be conducted by Pranav. So we will be put, we will be sharing the links uh, of the meetups um, soon for this particular event. So do register and do join uh, that event as well. Um, and I think that's it. So if we are done, then we can close this session. And once again, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, thanks, Goran, especially for you yeah. for sparing a time for us and giving a valuable yeah. inputs on the main, uh, important topic, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. See ya. See you. Bye. Bye.